Uh, yeah, so welcome. Welcome to my talk. Uh, yeah, so my topic is improving scalability of Zen, the 3000 domains experiment. Uh, it's going to be a mixture of things. So the first thing is uh, I'd like to introduce to you the Zen architecture. But thanks to Lars, he did a very good job just now. So I don't, I don't, I don't need to explain it anymore. So I'm just going to skip that part. So that I guess I can save everybody a few minutes or even 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then um, uh, almost identical, but uh, his pictures are much more beautiful than, than mine, of course. <laughs> yeah. And then the second part is the current scalability status. Um, and then the third part is some work undergoing in our community to address the scalability problems at the moment. And the fourth part is about this experiment and the demo. And finally, I will also give you some interesting findings I see in this experiment. Yeah, and let's get started. So yeah, I guess there's, because Lars has done this before, so I'm going to skip this as well, because well, I'm not really a very good marketing person. <laughs> not, really, not really good at speaking these kind of things. So yeah. Yeah. Cloudy Zen, yeah. So Zen has a very large user base, estimated more than 10 million individual users, and how is the largest cloud in the world? And also is also fund, uh, foundations for several client side projects like Qubit OS and Zen Kind. Yeah, cool, great, yeah. And then the most important bit to, to, to the open source community is that it, it is completely open source. It's released under GP, GPL v2 with BCO, it's just like Linux. So yeah, if anybody wants to hack Zen, you just need to deep clone the tree uh, and then write your patch and then sign it off, send it to Zen Devel, and you can get feedback very soon. Yeah, that's also cool. And we also have a very diverse community, just as Lars showed us. So yeah, I'm gonna skip this part. And also the same architecture. Yeah, as you can see, my my picture is a lot more uglier than Lars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for a compliment. <laughs> huh? Sorry. Yeah, and this PV protocol. Uh, yeah, actually last didn't have this. I'm gonna explain this. Yeah, so the PV protocol is the proc is a generic protocol used between the front end and back end device. Uh, so now we have a consensual ring in the memory, uh, which is divided into several slots. Each slot uh, is a union of response and request. So in general, the front end, um, need, if the front end needs to send something to the back end, it puts the request in the slot and then notify the back end via the event channel. Then the back end gets the request from the slot and process it and then put the response in the ring as well and then notify the front end via event channel as well. Uh, so this event channel thing is a uh, primitive provided by Zen. Uh, which is used to do notifications. And actually is a very important primitive in Zen. There are many things that are mapped into this event channel. Uh, for, uh, so they are, the things that are mapped into event channels are the physical IRQ, that's the interrupt line from the real hardware, real device, and the virtual IRQ, which is the interrupt for the virtual device and also IPI, which is the interprocessor interrupt. And the last but not least thing is the interdomain uh, notification event channel. So the event channel shown here is the interdomain event channel, which is used to notify uh, both ends. And yeah, so it's a very important component in the Zen 
uh, system. And it's very critical to the scalability problem. Uh, yeah. So this is driver domain, which is also covered by Lars just now. And also this is the HVM guest. Um, yes. And this is PDHEM guest. So, uh, I really don't have much to talk about, uh, about this guest, uh, but I just need to remind you that these arrow lines here and here, they are basically all event channels. So the scalability of Zen is somewhat limited by the number support, number of event channels supported by the whole system. So the current scalability status. So uh, the latest release of Zen is Zen 4.2. Uh, in that release, we support up to five terabytes of host memory. Uh, yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Russell. You mentioned about event channels. Yeah. The, you know, the limitation of event channels. So is it limited by hardware? No, no, no. It, uh, no, actually it's a software thing. So I'm going to go into detail just a bit later. So yeah, that's to be, be a bit patient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the current status of the SAN scalability. In the SAN 4.2 release, uh, you can support up to five terabytes of host memory. That's for 64 bit builds. And also up to 4,095 host CPUs. It's also for 64 bit bits. And if you are running a PVB app, you can have up to 512 vCPUs. And if you are running an HVM VM, you can have 256 vCPUs for that VM. However, um, what does PV stand for? HVM stand for? Ah, yeah, I, 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 I saw you in last talk. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, I, Sorry. So the PV is short for para virtualized. So in this, uh, so you so in Cali now, yeah. HVM is hardware virtual machine. Yeah, that's uh, VM with hardware virtualization extension support. Yeah. So thanks, last. <laughs> yeah. But the event channel is relatively small. Now, in the current design, we only have uh, 1K for 32-bit domains, and then 4K for 64-bit domains. So let's do a simple calculation. Uh, in a typical PV or PVH VM DOM U, uh, we have 256 megabytes to 240 gigabytes of RAM for that VM. So I, I didn't make this up. So I got, I got this data from the internet. So Amazon does have some crazy bit instance with 240 gigs of RAM. Yeah, it's genuine. But yeah, it's not really a bit there because like in the 64-bit architecture, your OS can easily handle that amount of RAM, right? Uh, then for the CPU, Typically, you have 1 to 16 virtual CPUs for a VM. Of course, you can have more, but yeah, that's probably enough for your daily usage. So it's also not a really, not really a bottleneck for the um, Zen host, uh, for the Zen system. Then you need at least four interdomain event channels for a VM. The first one is the Zen board. So the Zen store is the central database to store domain configurations and exchange configuration informations. Uh, yeah, so it, it consumes one event channel. And then the second one is the console. The console, you can think of it as a counterpart of the serial, con uh, serial port of the physical machine. And uh, it consumes one event channel as, as well. And then if you want to do something practical, like uh, communicating with the external world, then you need a virtual network interface. 
that needs an event channel to do notification as well. And the last one is if you want to store data uh, in your image, then you need a disk. That's a virtual block device. Then, uh, so for a typical dumb you, you need at least four event channels. You would need more if you want more devices, or if we have like a multi-queue width in the future, uh, one width will consume more event channels as well. So the calculation is as follow. From a backend domain's point of view, is that like a DOM0 or driver domain, or they are called backend domains in general. So from a backend domain's point of view, it need it has its own uh uh not not like uh IRQ or PIRQ or VIRQ. So the number of event channels consumed by this three things are related to the number of CPUs and devices. So a typical DOM0, uh, they have, uh, it has like uh, 20 to 200. And then uh, the remaining is like uh, whatever, then divided by four, which yields less than 1,024 guests supported for 64-bit backend domains. And then even less for 32 bit domains. Then people might ask so, 1000 domains, that still sounds big, right? Yes, that's actually a very big number if you are using it in a normal use case. If you only run dozens of domains or even hundreds of domains to run your typical workloads, like a fully fledged Linux running Apache mail server or whatever service you see fit. So 1,000 domains is actually quite enough for, for, uh, for this time. But uh, we certainly have some use case that can easily hit this limit. For example, the Open Mirage pro project, uh, which is also mentioned by Lars, is an incubator project of the same project. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, I get it right, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it tries to spawn as many VMs as possible to serve the external world, so it can easily hit this limit. So now we are trying to look into the future and see if we are preparing for the next step of this, of the Zen world. Yeah, but just uh, rest assured, if you are just running your normal world load, and that that. You can uh, Stan can handle this well at this stage. So yeah, I joined Citrix last December, and I was asked to look at the scalability issues of Zen at that time. And then I saw an email on Zen user list. It's a user who tried to run one thousand DOM use on a single host. So that. Uh, Dom U is actually a modified mini OS, but it had a problem. He said, uh, well, I couldn't access the Dom U. They seem to be running, but I couldn't access the Dom U. Then I um, took a look at that. Um, actually, 1000 domain is not really a big deal. Uh, if, you, if you remember with the calculation we just did. So it's actually what running 1000 domain is actually uh, the, is more or less the two stack limit. Uh, yeah, so the main problem the user had is the Zen console. He couldn't access the console of the domain. So he had a problem ac accessing the 338th domain and onwards. Yeah, I will, I will explain that. I know that. I know the genuine cause of that. <laughs> and then I fix that. Could this uh, possibly be a restriction of the hardware platform they were running on? Maybe they ran out of some resources on the platform? Or? No, no, no. That You, you mean the 1000 domain thing? I'm just saying you, they couldn't access the console. That's what I'm curious about. Ah, uh, yeah. That's actually just a software problem. And you already fixed it. And then 
well, I, I saw this email and then I thought, well, 1,000 domain, well, that's not, that's not, there's no fun in doing that because Sangen didn't handle that. Then I thought, well, how about 3,000? So let's get to that. Because with that number of domains, we can definitely hit the eventual limit. Even if we only equip each domain with only two event channels, that's one for Zen store and one for Zen console, they will come through up to 6,000 event channels, that's, uh, that ha which has already exceeded the uh, 4K limit of the 64-bit build. And also, we could possibly discover the two-stack limit as well as the backend limit. And a more open-ended question is that, is it really practical to run this uh, huge number of domains at this stage? Or uh, what should we care and what should we look into in the near future? What needs to be in improved? So that's an open-ended question. So yeah, let's get to that. So the first thing is the two-stack limit. Started with the 1,000 domain thing. So why, why couldn't the user access the number 338th domain in onwards? That's because Zen console D and Zen store D, they use select. And the select system port, they, uh, so do, do you program? Uh, uh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Um, yeah. So that system core has a limit in Linux which can only handle 1024 file descriptors at the same time. So the same console case is that uh, it has to open like uh, nine file descriptors when it starts up and then three file descriptors for each domain. So hence 300 38 multiplied by 3 plus 9, that's 1024. Yeah? So this one is easy actually. I just wrote a patch to switch to the uh, full system core, which uh, in theory can support like, uh, anyway, thousands, tens of thousands. But yeah, that should be enough. And this patch for both same console D and same store D has been uh, upstream. So this two step limit is in fact gone now. Yeah. Then there's the bigger problem. Yeah, the event channel limit. Actually, it was identified as the key feature for for, for three release. So two designs came up by far. Um, the first one is a three level event channel ABI. And the second one is the FIFO eventual ABI. Yeah, I'm going to go into detail. Yeah. It could be a bit boring, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the three level ABI. Um, it was designed and aimed for the for the free time frame, which is so it needs to be straightforward and simple. So in fact, it's just an extension to the default two-level API. So hence, it gets this name. And it was started in December 2012. And then uh, nowadays, it, uh, the B version 5 drop has been posted and it's almost ready. So let's first look at the default API. The default API has been around for a long time, like a decade or so, yeah. Right. Uh, so in this ABI, each event is represented by two bits, one for pending and one for mask. So there is a global share bitmap of events. If an event is set pending, then the corresponding bit in that bit mask bitmap is set. Furthermore, if that event is not globally masked. Uh, we'll try to so that there is a upper level selector which you, is used to speed up the pickup path. So each bit in the selector is mapped to a single word in the server bitmap. 
So yeah, if the event is set pending and it's not globally matched, uh, then the corresponding bit in the, in the selector is set. And finally, uh, if the event is not globally disabled, there's an uphold pending flag in each uh, VCP structure set. Uh, and that is set as well. So the kernel knows that, uh, so on every return from Zen context to the kernel context, the kernel takes a look at the uphold pending flag. If that uphold pending flag is set, it knows that there is an event pending. Then it looks at the selector and picks up the bit, the pending bit in the selector. And then it picks up the corresponding word in the share bit map. And then it picks up the actual bit in the pending bit map that represents the event. And finally calculates uh, the port, in the, the event port and then handle that. So this is the uh, set pending and pick up path. So the three level ABI is designed as follow. So we simply extend another level of the, of the uh, bitmap. So now we have two, uh, two selectors, the first level selector and the second level selector. So the Set pending path is like, uh, well, we first need to set the bit in the bitmap. Then, if it's not masked, we set the bit in the second level selector. And then set the bit in the first level selector. And finally, the upcall pending flag. And the uh, kernel side pickup path is just the other way around. It sees the upcall pending flag, it picks up the first level selector, and then the second level selector, and finally, the actual event itself. So yeah. Uh, you mean the memory footprint or the time? Time it's very pretty hard to measure at, and it's, it has not been measured at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this approach it's actually simply several bit operations which is should be fast. Yeah. So the number of event channels supported by this this design is that now we can have 32k for 32 bit guests and 256k for 64 bit guests. And the boot memory footprint is that now we have two bits per event. It's pending and masked. So we need two or 16 pages for 32 or 64-bit guests respectively. And we also need to map number of vCPUs pages uh, for the controlling structures into same. Uh, furthermore, this ABI is only envisioned for DOM0 in driver domain. Uh, other DOM use, use the default ABIs because Normal DOM U can never use so many event channels. Yeah. So the pros for this ABI is that the general concept and race conditions are very, uh, very well understood and tested. And it's only envision for DOM zero and driver domains. So the memory footprint is not very large. But the downside is that this flat bit map has no priority. Uh, this is the downside inherited from the two-level design. And then there's the people ABI. So the motivation is that uh, as we are designing new ABIs after all, why don't we just start ground up and get more gravy features? Yeah. And the design draft was posted in February. And the first prototype posted in March, it's still under development. Uh, close at hand should be ready by 4.4 release. So yeah. In this ABI, each event is represented by a 32-bit word. And it's placed in a queue. Uh, so yeah. So each event word is divided into different sections. The highest three bits 
are used as pending bit, mass bit, and link bit. The pending bit, is, uh, pending bit in ma and mass bit is easy to understand, but the link, uh, the link bit it means that this event is in chain, is is chained in a queue, and then the lower seventeen bits are used to uh, as the link field, which is used to uh, point to the next event in queue. So we also have a several per CPU control structure. This per CPU control structure uh, has different uh, has holds several Cubes. So this one is a. Uh, so this one represents a queue, and this one as well. So with this design, now we have event priority. We can assign events to different queues, but uh, with different priority. And then here we uh, we have a picture showing an empty queue and and a non-empty queue. So on the left hand side is the empty queue. So only the link field are shown. So there is nothing in here. And on the right hand side there is a non-empty queue. So for example, we have this uh like Q0, the tail is one and head is five. So that means the first event in queue is number five. And then we pick pick this up and then we look at the link field, which points to the seven, number seven event. That's the next event in queue. And then picks up the number one event, goes to one, and we see zero of, oh, there's nothing more in the queue. So, uh, but as this design makes every event a 32 bit word, the state machine is a bit more complex uh, compared to the three level design. So number of events event channel supported is 128k by design because now the link field has six, uh, 17 bits, but it it is extensible. It is extensible. Yeah, extensible. Yeah. Then the memory footprint, one thirty-two bit word per event, so that we need up to 128 pages per guest. To map all this event queue into Zen. And also, we need number of virtual CPUs pages for controlling structures mapped in Zen as well. So, with this design, we should definitely use two stack to limit the maximum number of event channel DOM you can have. Otherwise, a normal DOM you may consume up to 128 pages in Zen. That's really not desirable. So the pros are that uh, now that with this design we have event priority because we have several queues we can handle them with priority, and then the second thing is the people ordering. You can guarantee that the first in first out priority because it's a people queue. But the downside is that it has relatively large memory footprint because it is uh, by default should by design needs to be enabled for all domains otherwise yeah yeah otherwise it, it has no clear advantage compared to the three level design so here's the community decision uh actually this scalability issue is not as urgent as we thought only the open mirage project expressed interest in actual event channel so the decision is that we need to delay this until 4.4 release because the maintainers think uh, it's better to just maintain one more ABI than two. And also, uh, by that time, you should be able to measure both solutions and take one, take a better one. And because event handling is complex by nature, so it would be the better uh, lead time to test both designs. Yeah, enough pros and cons and theories and calculations. So let's back to that, huh? Yeah. Are there any um, attacks that the two um, approaches, or the three maybe, including the two ABIs, might be more um, 
susceptible to, um, whether they're denial of service attacks or or other types of attack that that make a difference uh, from the security side or not really. Yeah, we haven't discussed this. So can you repeat that? Yeah, I'm just thinking. Are there any are there any security um, issues around the event handling? If I can create a denial of service um, based on my knowledge of of the event handling, um, it might be that one is more susceptible to being to being attacked than another. If I can, if I can flood the event queue in such a way that it can't be handled in a timely manner. Oh, you mean the people design? Well, either or design both. is either it, design. is it's either design better in terms of that than the other. Ah, yeah. So you mean flooding the event queue or whatever thing? Just just pr by producing lots of lots of events. Yes, for instance, yeah. So yeah. E our team used to have the discussion, used to have a discussion about the fairness of these two designs. So, from the domain, from the the discussion of it being secure to being robust. Mm -hmm. um, it's like if you're flooding it with excessive use of a particular resource and it's running out of that resource, how well does it have it, Does it have a fail-safe mechanism, basically? How does it fail? Is one failing more gracefully compared to the other? That's, that was your question, right? Right, right, I understand. Uh, yeah. It's food for thought. So... How do you define the breaker? Uh, hmm. um, I, I chair the WebCL working group. In that regard, we've been looking at, okay, um, denial of service. One definition for a OpenCL or WebCL kernel in denial of service is that um, a kernel takes such a long period of time that it literally overuses the resources, its share of resources, so can bring a GPU to the halt. So depending on your scenario, your denial of service may have different definitions. Um, you know, in the, the example of a, a um, Amazon server, you could put so many requests to it that it brings it down to its knees. So denial of service meaning somebody's using up so many resources that there are none left for anyone else, and as a result, system excessively slows down or gets down to a practical halt. So in that scenario, in the event queue, if too many events were getting generated, um, how will it handle that? A, can it detect that um, there's a potential attack? And, uh, you know, first the detection comes, and then the second step would be if and when it detects that, does it have a fail-safe mechanism? How does it fail in a, in a graceful manner to where the whole system doesn't get, get brought down? So, so your whole VM is not getting brought down as a result. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, denial of not, service not, is a catch-all really phrase sorry. that people tend to use that any time somebody's using more resources relative uh, to everyone else, it is. If we, don't yeah. know, if we don't know, we can think about it in the future. Just wondered if we had thought about it already. Yeah. Because I, I'm not quite sure if I get you right. Because you mean by flooding the queue, there's actually no way of flooding the queue, but only affecting the processing, processing process. I mean, yeah, if uh, in the two or three level API design, like setting event is just setting a bit. If it is already set, then it's already set. So there's no way like overflowing the bitmap or queue or whatever. And then in the people ABI design, if you uh, uh, would like to retrain the already pending event into the queue, you can't do that because it, it's already in the queue. Uh, the state machine prevents you from doing that. It, it, 
So in both in both designs, it, it is guaranteed that your event, even if your event is being raised multiple times, you can you only see one event uh, from the backend domain's point of view or whatever domain's point of view. So there's not really a way to flooding this thing. Let's let's carry on. We I'm sure we can think of some ways to be evil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah especially in a in a public talk, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, just where was I next? Um, yeah. So yeah, the experiment itself. Uh, even though none of this design, neither of this design was taken by 4.3, uh, I still did this uh, experiment just to see if there's uh, any interesting findings in this thing. So yeah, I, I took advantage of the three level design because it's, it's almost ready and it's, it's usable now. So yeah. The first one is the 3000 mini OS thing. Yeah, the harvest bed is two sockets, four cores, 16 threads, and with 24 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's actually just a normal server. And the software configuration is the Donjuro has 16 vCPUs, which is uh, more than enough. For it. And then four gigs of RAM, and each mini OS has one vCPU and four megabytes of RAM. As well as two event channels. There's one for Zen Store and one for Zen Console. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be a quick demo. Because, uh, so now we have, uh, yeah, ready? Ready? Uh, uh, just too long a list. Just no fun, yeah. They are actually running, and you can connect to 2996, okay, uh, yeah, as you wish, 2996, right, okay. Ah, uh, 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 no, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just, just a bit laggy, yeah, because, well, the same, uh, even if I switch to the core FD, Handling so many FDs, it's still rather slow. Yeah. You could probably try something else, like a uh, big event, like the event driven library crazy thing. But it's just too much work at this stage because we, we are called this now. Yeah. If you want that, we can do that in the future. Yeah, it's really not doing anything useful. But at least we can see that it's receiving events and it's delivering events so yeah actually it's working just to prove that and there's any other things like domain creation time but i don't know whether i can show you uh yeah let's forget about this let's go to another one just three thousand linux or so yeah just 3000 mini OS is just easy, easy as pie. So. What about 3000 Linux? Uh, so we need a much more powerful machine. So there's one machine called Hydro Monster in our lab, <laughs> which has a socket, 80 cores, and 160 threads, and half a terabyte of RAM. Then the software configuration is that the DOM0 has four vCPUs and each CPU, vCPU is pinged to a physical CPU. And also it has 32 gigs of RAM, which is also too much for it. I think. And each DOM U has one vCPU and 64 megabytes of RAM and three event channels. That's two, uh, two, two, the normal two, like, same store and same console and one for the VIP. Uh, but I don't have a virtual disk configured for this DOM U. That's because it's just too painful to access. Like, uh, I mean, uh, you can imagine just like 
several thousand process accessing the hard disk at the same time. That would be dog slow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So then we change to this Hydra master. Uh, I'm going to do this Excel list once again and flush the screen. So actually they have been running for like uh, 10 days and they seems to be running well because the CPU times keeps on growing. That means the events are not lost. They can get timers, events, they get scheduled, they get CPU times to run. Uh, and then, like uh, let's connect to one of these. Like a D3000. Just pick one. Uh -huh. Develop. 3000? Oh no, not this one. I might have broke. Okay, it's not broken. Yeah, so this is just a normal busy box shell. Uh, now I also have a network interface, but with no IP address design. Uh, that's because it would be so rude to ask for several thousand IP address in our network. <laughs> Gany guy gonna blame me for that. Yeah. And then, yeah. Let's also have some fun. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's just too slow. Probably. Yeah, that's the lock. It's just, yeah, nothing special, just normal boot up. And, then, and then, yeah, I installed Tetris in this one. So <laughs> if you don't mind, <laughs> I'm gonna play Tetris for the rest of my talk. Yeah, I'm just joking. Yeah. And then let's look at the bridge. Uh, it's also going to flush the screen. Yeah, actually, there's a limitation of the Linux bridge, which only allows you to attach like 1024 interface on the same bridge. So, if you really want to connect this like several thousand domain, you may need to uh, fiddle with the IP tables or whatever things. Yeah, it's just a bit painful. I didn't do that. And also, we can have a look at how many event channels we have. Up from zero. Oops, wow, there's 9,000 or more. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the demo. It's quite simple, but it's working. Uh, yeah. Then there are some observations uh, I got from this experiment. The first thing is the domain creation time. By domain is uh, creation time, I mean the uh, from the point you type in Excel create and then you get back to the prompt. That's the domain creation time. If you create a less than five hundred domains, that time is actually acceptable. Like uh, less than five seconds, you get back to the prompt. Uh, but if you create more than 800, uh, 800 that is rather slow, taking like 10, or 10 seconds or 20, uh, 20 seconds or so. And then finally, it took hours to create 3,000 domains. So, yeah, like, uh, no, 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 I, I didn't do that by hand. I wrote a script. Of course, I wouldn't do that by hand. Yeah, but I did run that one or two one once or twice just to see how much that, how much time it takes to create like the three hundred three thousand at first domain. So actually that time was like uh, forty seconds. Wow, that's completely not acceptable at all. That's like uh the tools that gets the gets gets the config file, uh extract the kernel and then uh brings uh write the entries to Zen store and then bring up the device model. Uh, and then goes back. That still takes forty seconds, which is not very acceptable. Yeah, I would say. 
And then the second observation is the backend bottleneck. The first thing is the network bridge limit in Linux, I, which I just talked about. Like you can only attach like 1024 interface to a single bridge. And then there's the PV backend driver buffer starvation. Uh, at, at this time, the, because uh, the PV backend drivers are, are not designed to run support uh, this huge number of domains. So, for example, if you run iperf uh, to your DOM0 simultaneously on several domains, basically everyone gets stuck. Uh, yeah. And also, the IO speed is not acceptable, especially the disk IO speed. That's why I didn't configure a disk for every DOM unit. Uh, also, there's a rough estimation. Uh, Linux with 4 gigs of RAM can al only allocate about 40, uh, 45 thousands of game channels due to its limit, uh, memory limitation. Uh, but that's probably enough for daily usage. And then another star uh, observation, which is quite obvious, is the CPU starvation. Because now with like uh, 3,000 domains running on a single host. Uh, we have a density like uh, one physical CPU versus 20 virtual CPUs. So if we don't dedicate several physical CPUs to uh, critical service domains, basically uh, you have a very high chance to uh, destroy the whole system. Uh, I did make a mistake. Uh, that's like uh, several domains spinning up, and they are consuming too much uh, vCPU. Then DOM zero uh, stop, and it stops stop. So the whole system is unusable. So we actually need to dedicate several physical CPUs to critical service domains. So the conclusion is that. Thousands of domains is doable, but I mean it's achievable, but it's not very critical. So, because we have still have many more uh, bottleneck to address. The first thing is the hypervisor entry step. We need to speed up the creation. We might have bottleneck in the two step, or in the hypervisor, or in both. But that still needs to uh, investigate more. And also the hardware bottleneck. The only thing we can do is to just to wait for a much more powerful machine. There's not really nothing, nothing more we can do. And then the TV backend drivers, the buffer size. Uh, this one could be addressed by like uh, with, uh, make it configurable by host admin. But yeah, we also need to investigate a bit into the processing model of the backend drivers. So, and the possible practical way to run thousands of domains that's in disaggregation, just try to offload the service to dedicated domains and trust the same scheduler to do the right thing. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this because I'm, yeah, I'm not an expert in this field. Yeah, so thank you. That's all. Thank you.